after that, you can share your screen and uh, you can start. Or like maybe or while I'm while I'm introducing, you can start to share your screen. Then yes. and then after that, as soon as I finish inter introduction of you, maybe you can start. I guess. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah. Cool. Right. And um, I hope everyone is here. Uh, uh, do you know how to share my screen? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course you can. And I think uh, everyone, I mean, just before we start, I mean, before we just share your screen, I think everyone can turn on your um, turn on your video and say hi. And make sure if there is everyone. <laughs> Okay, so um, okay, this is uh, yeah. And other else, uh, can you please turn on your video for for now? Uh, can you see my screen now? Ah, yes, yes. So yeah, maybe I think since like almost one, almost everyone is here, so I think I can start to introduce you. So yeah, everyone like uh, the Uje Song is uh, founder of SAP and VA and Seoul based design studio, heavily utilizing digital techniques in architecture and design. He's a registered architect in New York State and has been an architect and designer since 2003, working with internationally renowned design practice in New York and Seoul, including OMA. SHOP, Green Show, and Samu Architects in Seoul. And he's currently teaching at Korea University in Seoul as an adjunct professor and used to teach uh, numerous parametric design workshops at Harvard, Cornell, UPenn, and uh, Syracuse. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, and CCNY. He received his Master of Architecture from Cornell University in Ithaca. New York and Bachelor's of Science in Architecture and Civil Engineering from Yonsei University, Seoul, Korea. And from now on, it's, uh, it's uh, your time, Jay. So yeah, you can start from now. All right. So um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wu Jay. So um, thank you for having me for this great conference. Uh, so um, I would like to introduce myself briefly uh, and uh, about my company uh, before we dive into the lecture, uh, if that is okay with you. So um, the name of my practice uh, is, uh, like he mentioned, uh, SAPND, uh, which is a very strange name for an architecture practice uh, that's been suggested a lot in the past. Uh, so as you can see from the logo type here on the screen, uh, it is basically composed of three arms under the same hood. So SA, a selective amplification, uh, which is very hard to pronounce. Um, but, you know, here we try to focus on architecture and uh, interior design, uh, actively using uh, various types of digital techniques uh, and media in the design process. So in PN, uh, Par Nouveau, um, as in Art Nouveau or a New Art, aims to create something new from parametric design and computation, uh, mostly dealing with furniture, industrial design, products, or installation, etc. And uh, DA, uh, design autonomy, on the other hand, uh, like the other two, doesn't really deal with uh, design itself, but it rather provides uh, parametric driven solutions for architects and designers. So for example, it automates uh, some of the very time consuming or labor intensive processes on every basis of design. And uh, separately, I have been running my uh, personal blog uh, to archive teaching materials from the past. So um, please take a look if you have a chance. So um, initially, um, I wanted to present some uh, of design works from either uh, SA uh, or PN. 
but I kind of thought that uh, you guys have seen something similar too much uh, during the workshop and conference. So I just wanted to be uh, more useful here in this context. So I'm here just trying to open up your perspectives and uh, show uh, parametric tools and computational design uh, can be very useful uh, in a slightly different array as well. So uh, with that in mind, um, I have prepared uh, two most recent projects that I did uh, in collaboration with uh, GS Construction and Engineering, uh, which is obviously one of the largest a and &E companies in the Korean market. So um, the first project here on the screen is a design automation in apartment complex layout. So you might think uh, designing an apartment complex is a very sophisticated and complicated task uh, by just looking at this picture. Um, I think this is somewhat true, uh, but if you look at it closely, uh, then you'd realize it is just a combination of mathematical formulas between buildings and the site boundary. So for example, um, your building to building distance, uh, which is one of the most important zoning regulations uh, to guarantee the minimum solar access per unit, is just a function of building heights of facing units. So if, for example, uh, here on the screen, uh, if the buildings face each other on major window base, then they should just be apart uh, from each other at least 0.5 times of the building height. It's that simple. And um, if you have any windows uh, with less than 0.5 square meters in area uh, on your building face, uh, then the distance can come down. So uh, in this case, um, here on the screen, if they are not facing a major window base, like in the diagram, uh, then they can get closer down to 80 meters. Or um, if they face each other uh, on no window facades, um, here, uh, like in the diagram, uh, they can get even closer down to four meters to each other. And uh, in terms of uh, relationship between the site boundaries and buildings, uh, buildings should be recessed at least 0.5 times of the building height uh, from the property lines or the center of the center, center line of the street nearby. So although uh, those are just a fraction of uh, zoning regulations or building codes that you have to comply with, you can guess that the entire process can be broken down into a series of mathematical calculations like this. So uh, this is the overall process of the automation, uh, which is composed of uh, roughly uh, four different types of clusters. So here yellow means uh, the input data modules and blues are uh, processing uh, data processing modules. Uh, purples are validity checker modules, um, and the greens are evaluation modules. And then uh, there is so uh, this is the overall uh, process of the automation, uh, which is fine. so the solid red uh, arrows. Um, it is uh, sort of like a mandatory input uh, that you must uh, provide uh, or feed uh, to the definition. And the blank uh, void uh, arrow uh, is sort of like an optional input. So you may or may not uh, put any data uh, for these steps. And the, the first module uh, gets the shape and uh, numerical input uh, for the site, such as site boundary, uh, building boundary, uh, adjacent lot or street center lines, or max building height, uh, building ratio, FAR, uh, context building masses, and the view targets, and so on. And um, this information will be fed into the checker module, uh, like in the arrow here. Uh, to see if the building layout satisfies all the zoning regulations and building codes. 
um, even for the site. And then uh, in the next module, uh, you could plan data such as shape and type of unit, uh, cores and building plans. Then in the next module, uh, the 2D plans will turn into 3D buildings uh, based on uh, the pneumatic information such as numbers of floors, floor to floor heights, and then a uh, podium level from ground as trap. And then, then in the next step, uh, based on the 3D model, uh, it will create QD boundary in XY plane. So here you see the solid greens are uh, 3D buildings. Uh, and the green lines here are 2D boundaries for each buildings, just to make sure uh, that the buildings are not close to each other or cross the site boundary. For this, you need to feed some information such as building to building distance, building to site boundary, and um, you know, wall to wall distance, wall to minor windows, etc. So lots of information. And then in the next step, uh, you set the translation method. So by which I mean uh, the way how you move your buildings uh, within your site boundary. So there are three methods uh, for this. You can move your buildings in XY plane, uh, probably, uh, or you can also rotate them in a consistent fashion altogether, uh, or you can um, set angles for each building separately if you want. So uh, once your building layout is ready and done, um, then, um, it is time to check uh, if it clears all those given regulations and codes, uh, such as sole access rule, uh, building to building clearance, building to site boundary clearance, as truck. And, um, you know, in most cases, um, um, you know, uh, any, any given layout uh, doesn't uh, clear all those items in the list. So if that happens, you know, you have uh, options to go back uh, to change your building heights, or uh, you can change the building position uh, within the site. Uh, then the definition basically repeat uh, this process uh, over and over again until it clears all the items in the list, uh, which typically takes about an hour. So apparently uh, there will be multiple building layouts that satisfy all these regulations and codes. And we just wanted to pick and choose the best one among others. So we introduced a qualitative evaluation method at the end of the process. So every single alternatives will be evaluated in terms of solar access and view shed. So you can see which performs the, uh, performs the best. So this is how it was implemented in Grasshopper. Um, modules were coded in C sharp, and uh, each one of them is very specific but a fairly simple task. Uh, so you can easily track uh, data flow uh, throughout the entire process. Uh, also, we can easily monitor and identify uh, if something goes wrong. And uh, because they are compartmented, uh, we can easily add or remove modules as needed uh, later. So here you have your plan data sorted by layers and properties. And uh, you have a location of your windows on plan as well. And then they have uh, properties and so you can uh, communicate with Grasshopper easily. And uh, we get a buildable envelope uh, based upon the site information that we fed uh, into the definition. So whatever is inside of the boundary is just okay. And uh, from there on, uh, you fed uh, some key information for the projects, uh, such as numbers of buildings and uh, numbers of floors for each building uh, to start with. Then you get uh, the 2D and 3D models uh, as in the screen. So 
So like I said, uh, the solid grid is just you know 3D building blocks. And then uh, there will be um, in a series of 2D outlines uh, that basically uh, defines uh, the building to building distance or uh, building to site boundary distance as true. And then you can choose a translation method uh, to move around your buildings within the site. Uh, then you get your initial layout of the buildings on the site, um, as in the as in the screen graph. Then you hook up your uh, number slides, um, number slides uh, for uh, the location of your buildings within the site or uh, numbers of floors uh, of your buildings. So all those number slides will be connected into um, this uh, the server, uh, which we, uh, in our case, it was Alpasum, uh, one of those application servers out there. And then uh, the iteration starts. So every single checker module has its own output uh, as a real number. And uh, if the number equals to zero, then it means your building layout clears that specific piece of building code or zoning regulation. Uh, so the total thinness, uh, which is the sum of all the output numbers from each module, uh, tells you how good your building layout is. So uh, when this number gets to um, uh, zero, then it means your building layout uh, clears every single uh, hurdles uh, that you have to uh, clear. So once you get the layout, um, you know, uh, then then you evaluate this with, uh, like I said before, uh, daylight performance uh, and uh, view shed as well. So those are three of screen captures uh, of the iterations at two slightly different algorithms side by side uh, here on the screen. Uh, so they start with uh, the identical layout as in the screen. And uh, those colored dots indicate issues in um, complying with zoning regulations or uh, building codes. And then um, as the iteration repeats, uh, the numbers of those um, of the markers uh, decrease. And uh, finally, uh, one on the upper right hand side uh, clears all these hurdles. And then this is going to be uh, one of the successful layouts. So uh, this is just a fast forwarded um, you know, uh, screen record uh, of the process. So you can see um, as time goes, the, uh, the numbers of um, the markers will decrease drastically. And then you can also um, the change of the graph here and there. So like I said, uh, they're using a slightly different algorithm uh, to each other. So uh, one of the left-hand side um, has a very steep curve uh, at the beginning, and then uh, it uh, certainly flats out uh, in the middle. Uh, compared to that, um, you know, the other one here on the right hand side, uh, it has more consistent curve uh, all the way down uh, to zero. And then um, if um, my memory serves me right, uh, this process took about uh, uh, an hour and 10 minutes or something. And then here you can see that um, this one uh, clears all those um, um, items in the list while this one is still working on it. And then uh, here you have a uh, few uh, different uh, alternative layout uh, for your uh, apartment complex. All right. So um, the next project, 
um, here on the screen is um, uh, design automation in a parking garage layout. I uh, feel like I'm, I'm just like an expert of uh, laying things out. <laughs> but so uh, unlike the other uh, process, uh, this one uh, is really straightforward and uh, linear. So it doesn't have any iterations or uh, optimization, uh, but the way how it works is really straightforward. You just basically put some input uh, for your uh, definition, and then the grasshopper does its job, uh, and it produces two uh, D graphics um, at the uh, as a result. So uh, the basic information from Rhino um, include. Um, parking boundary, uh, which is in blue. Uh, building boundaries, of course, uh, which is in red. And then uh, some major circulations in yellow. And uh, there are custom parking types um, um, at, the, at the bottom of the screen, uh, which I'll explain later uh, in the presentation. So the first step is to set the max boundary uh, of the parking garage uh, based upon um, the, um, the site boundary uh, that you fed into the uh, definition uh, in the previous step. And then you basically set the size of uh, your parking cell. Um, in this case, it was uh, 8.2 meters um, square. And then you basically overlay uh, on top of uh, everything. And then uh, based on the relationship, uh, relative position um, uh, here, the site boundary, uh, Grasshopper set each cell's component, uh, either inside or outside. So you can see that uh, those cells in the building course are marked outside as well. So uh, because you can't really park your car inside of the, inside of the building core. So then I started uh, laying out um, uh, from the parameter of the side um, and the building cores, uh, which were marked in uh, white green uh, here on the screen. And then guess the inner island, uh, which is free for parking for sure. And then uh, one of the tricky thing here uh, in this process was that um, all those islands, um, actually some of those islands uh, have uh, more than four edges or um, and uh, some concave, co co concave corners. So we just need to break them down into multiple rectangles. So uh, we get the dividing segment uh, as shown in the screen graph here. And then there will be islands uh, between the rectangles uh, to let the cars move around freely. And then um, as you can see here, uh, there are typically two types of rectangles. Uh, so one at the uh, topmost one, the skinny one, uh, that has just one bay vertically. So in this configuration, we don't have any problems in laying out parking stores uh, in that grid. But um, the one right below, uh, the fatter one, um, you know, uh, it's going to be really impossible to park the car in the center row uh, because you know um, you can't really get there. So um, to mitigate this issue, um, the rectangle uh, that's better than uh, this the single the single bay uh, will be uh, break down into a series of uh, strips uh, once again. And uh, based on the geometry of the parking cells, uh, the grasshopper serves parking types uh, as in the picture. So uh, there will be um, uh, one, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 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 eight. There are 14 different types of parking type, uh, parking cell type. So here, DH means double loaded horizontal, uh, DV means a double loaded vertical. And then uh, SU means a single loaded uh, uh, facing up, right? and the rest of the uh, remaining convention is the same. Um, CUR means a corner uh, facing up and right, and the wall, WUR means a wall uh, facing up and right. 
So uh, this was the result of the process. Uh, so uh, you can basically say that uh, those green area, um, uh, you can park your car there. And then uh, combine this uh, with the parking code uh, that we generated in the previous step. Uh, it is uh, visualized with uh, proper graphics. And then here in the visualizer, uh, you can also set uh, lots of different things like uh, the dimension of your parking stall uh, or the column dimensions uh, or uh, the minimum the width uh, of the driveway uh, between the parking spaces. Um, and then, um, you know, uh, in, in some cases, you know, it is more efficient not to have a parking stalls uh, along the perimeter of the uh, parking garage. So if that happens, then uh, you can just, um, sorry, uh, use a different step on the slide. But um, yes, yeah, so, so um, okay, <laughs> sorry about that. So uh, if you want to add more uh, driveway uh, as a major path, then you can simply just uh, drop another polyline here. Uh, then uh, the grass apple will automatically uh, lay things out for you. And then, uh, like I said, you know, if you choose not to park on the perimeter of the uh, parking garage, uh, then you just you know, simply toggle this switch. And then if you change your mind and uh, you want to add uh, more parking spaces along the perimeter, then you can add polylines uh, to that specific location. And uh, in most cases, you know, it provides a reasonable parking layout, but uh, if you are um, uh, picky or if you have a very specific uh, needs uh, to park um, the car uh, in a specific spot, uh, then you can do it. Uh, for example, uh, there's a few uh, points uh, of the plan uh, with the bed circle. So if you want to uh, put more parking stores there, uh, then you can simply uh, drop the text dot uh, from the vinyl. Um, and uh, this is uh, the screen grab uh, of the process. It basically uh, uh, run through uh, the process. So you can basically change the parameter of the parking garage. Um, and then uh, it will instantly update your parking layout. And then you can also uh, play with, um, yeah, play around with your building course. And then you can add uh, another path uh, for your parking space as well. And uh, you can just toggle uh, on and off, uh, not to uh, park uh, along the perimeter of the parking garage or add uh, or vice versa. And then you can basically uh, fine tune your uh, parking layout uh, using uh, all those geometries uh, in the vinyl. Uh, for example, you can add more parking sp space using the text dots. And then you can also change the type of the parking uh, type uh, by just simply uh, changing the text. Okay, so um, I think uh, this is the end of the presentation. Uh, so um, if you have any uh, comments or uh, questions, uh, I'll, be I'll be happy to answer.
Oh, thank you, thank you, Jay. It was really great lecture, and I think I think this can be really inspired to people because anyway, the Shenzhen is like the fifth day of the workshop, and uh, uh, today's today's Taeyun's Taeyun's class was kind of like relate. I think it can be related to like especially your first project, uh, which is about mm -hmm. their the layouting the, the all the buildings and generating the location of the buildings i think it can be really simulated i mean it can be really related to Tayun's uh, lectures so i think uh, students can be really inspired by this and uh, yeah this is really interesting i guess so is there any so everyone i think uh, can you uh, Uze, can you maybe you can stop share your screen and all the students can turn on your camera and you can mute yourself and then if you have, if there is any question you can ask either like you can type on the chat then i can read for you so yeah okay. i'm quite interested in the parking section as well in the presentation so i i wonder how does the car so how does the car circulation kind of kind of plays out in in the plan, like, like after the generation, does that, uh, do you have to define where the cars would be going up or down, left or right on each path? How do you define those? So uh, you're 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 talking about the direction of your um, driveway, right? Right. So. Um, you know, um, this thing is uh, really optimized uh, for the apartment complex here in Korea. So uh, when you say uh, you have a module, uh, the square module of uh, 8.2 meters by 8.2 meters, then you can basically uh, fit in uh, six cars uh, in that uh, square, right? And then uh, if you have another blank module uh, right next to it, uh, the, the driveway width, uh, the width of the driveway uh, is going to be six meters, uh, which is more than enough to accommodate two cars um, uh, in parallel to each other. So uh, here in this diagram uh, or definition, uh, it doesn't consider any directionality of the driveway. Uh, does that answer your question? Oh, yes. Thank, thank you. Okay. Well, I also have a question related about that one because I also was wondering like how can we decide the entrance and outside for the parking lot? Maybe. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it seems like uh, in this case, like we give the path like which is also from the entrance to the uh, the exit, but uh -huh. like yeah, can you also like how can you say the optimize the uh, location of entrance and location of exit as well? Right. So, you know, uh, I'm not an expert in a design apartment complex, to be honest with you. Uh, but, um, you know, as far as I understand the process, um, you know, when you are given a site, uh, and the first thing that you do uh, is uh, decide uh, where the car in and out uh, should be. So that has a lot of different implications on the uh, site planning and then uh, urban context. So you don't have much freedom uh, to uh, locate uh, your entrance uh, to the parking garage area. So um, I was kind of thinking that uh, this is sort of like you know half given. So um, all you have to do is just to uh, pick the point uh, where the uh, the primary entrance should be, and then the, and then uh, the next thing you do is just connect those two points with uh, the polygon. Uh, so you can create a, a major path. Thank you. <laughs> and any other questions? Because I think, uh, especially the what Uze uh, showed today is is not only for your academia things. It also can be used your like for future. I mean, it also can be used your like practical way as well. So. If, yeah, I mean, if you can get anything from these ideas, I mean, it's really good. It will be really good for you guys. So yeah, ask any questions.
I mean, if you guys have any questions, then, um, you know, I actually prepared another package uh, just in case, uh, you know, um, it, uh, you, guys, you guys don't have any interest in, uh, you know, um, optimization or automation, etc. So um, why don't I present some other packages? Um, what, do you, what do you want to say? <laughs> is, it, is it okay or? I mean, of course, it will be really grateful. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's totally up to you guys. So I can present on and on. Uh, um, I can just, you know, sit down here and wait for your questions. Um, uh, either way works fine for me. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, of course, I think, yeah, I think it will be really great for, for the uh, students as well. But I mean, just before that to last check, is if there is any questions for the first lecture, I'll say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> feel free to ask question and yeah if you don't have any yeah i mean yeah can you kindly ask you to do that yeah the, your second package as well i would love to see that as well <laughs> i mean i didn't expect it to be um you know done um in that, mm. uh, that quickly but um, um hold on for a second sure well i mean actually i also, I also have a question for the uh, first lecture i mean so, I mean, maybe this is like very, how can I say, the very basic or general question for that. So, like, especially the uh, optimizing the location of the apartment, is it mm -hmm. like, can we call it kind of uh, machine learning? Like, because it seems uh, like- That, I'm not sure. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, <clears throat> uh, the logic that we use uh, for this optimization process uh, include, uh, what is called uh, genetic algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a whole lot of you know, uh, different um, variations uh, in, uh, under that category. Uh, and then uh, the specific one that I used uh, for it uh, was, uh, if I remember, remember it correctly, uh, it was a CMAES, uh, one of the uh, genetic algorithms. And then uh, my understanding is that um, that uh, CMAES, uh, um, uh, the machine learning or um, you know uh, other types of uh, the learning process uh, uh, through the uh, um, AI uh, utilize that kind of engine as well. But um, to your question, yes, uh, it could be yes and no uh, because it shares a certain component between. Um, uh, what I had uh, in the presentation and then uh, machine learning, but uh, they're not the same. So um, I think it's just a, a part of a machine learning uh, process. So um, yeah, I, I'm not a, a specialist in machine learning um, um, as you know, but so um, that's, that's just uh, my thought. So like, uh, like in the end of the optimization, like for example, if there is like, I mean, it can be generate like, like multiple possibilities, multiple results for that, isn't it? I mean, then like, how can we choose like, like if there's like multiple, if there's like multiple choices, how can we choose like, which is the best? How can, mm -hmm. how, how do we know that? So is it, is it should be done by like human selection or? Like yeah, so uh, one of the interesting uh, thing uh, when we talk about uh, automation um, um, is the fact that um, you know there's a uh, urban myth uh, that uh, when you say automation, uh, people generally believe that um, you have uh, you, you just need to uh, uh, hit a button, and then uh, the artificial intelligence or machine learning or whatever that is will do. Um, everything for you. Uh, this, uh, I think that's a sort of like a misconception uh, that people had uh, toward uh, this kind of technologies. But um, I'd rather see it uh, as a uh, as a utility uh, that uh, help you uh, work efficiently. So, um, I mean, uh, it could be like a combination of your uh, creativeness uh, plus. Uh, machine learning or um, uh, AI uh, that basically help you 
uh, to um, you know, get rid of uh, the, uh, the burden of doing the tedious, uh, time-consuming, you know, non-productive uh, things uh, from the entire process. So um, I hope uh, that answers your question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So do you also think like uh, maybe this optimization uh, like system can be, how can you say, uh, can be bring it to more like um, the other urban design, like urban context way, like for example, uh, I, mean, I mean, I cannot think about any proper example for now, but like, for example, if, if we can give like a lot of different uh, data, then uh, can it be also helpful for generating, like, I mean, for example, the park or the cities? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that's that's basically what we're trying to do uh, at uh, Social Art Movement, uh, isn't it? Uh, yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, I think you know, technically, it is feasible and uh, doable uh, for sure, uh, but um, you know. Uh, like I said, uh, in one of those meetings that we had uh, before, um, as an architect and designer, um, I don't have any background knowledge in, uh, on the city or um, the, the system of uh, you know, villages or something like that. So, um, you know, if I get um, um, enough information uh, about how the system works, uh, how do we plan a city uh, in a bigger scale, uh, then we can for sure um, utilize uh, this technology in um, that uh, direction for sure. So, um, okay. Um, any, any, if there is any other questions, then um, I'll just uh, share my screen. You sure. Okay. Um, let's sure that you have any other questions uh, on the first presentation. Was it was it uh, way too boring? Not at all. I don't think so. I mean, because uh, like yeah, currently a lot of them are a bit of shy students. So, uh -huh. and it was quite clear, I guess. So maybe yeah, students just enjoyed, I guess. Right. <laughs> it's amazing. Yes, the work. What was that? Sorry. The work is amazing. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, seems like there is no more question for now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. All right. Uh, so you guys see my screen now? Yes. Okay. So. Um, So as I um, you know, um, made you guys uh, bored uh, in the first presentation, uh, in the second one, uh, I'll just try to give you uh, some uh, design-related works. Um, okay, hold on for a second. So, So uh, this is um, a very old project, like uh, almost like 10 years ago. Um, the, the reason I'm showing this project to you um, is because um, uh, this is uh, actually the first project uh, that I came to know um, about the uh, partnership design um, um, as a part of the, uh, the fabrication class uh, that I took at Cornell uh, back in 2008. So, um, you know, uh, today's um, standard, uh, in today's standard, uh, it is uh, just a little bit cliche uh, and uh, um, old fashioned uh, in, in, in many different aspects. But um, I kind of, you know, at, back, at, back, back then, uh, I kind of thought that this is really cool. Uh, so, um, this project uh, is basically done uh, as a part of uh, the class that I took. Uh, the name of the class was uh, the component architecture. And then uh, we, the half of the other uh, class, uh, the 
half of the semester, uh, we learned uh, how to use generative component uh, from Bentley systems. Um, and then um, 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 after uh, this um, uh, half of the, uh, the, the semester, uh, we uh, basically developed our own project uh, using uh, GC and then uh, fabricate it uh, as a final product of the class. So um, the, here, um, the, the system is really straightforward and simple. Uh, so you have a, a single module uh, that basically have uh, two different uh, parameters. Uh, the first one is uh, the, the E, uh, the, the, uh, the oval height of the module. And then the second one is R, uh, the radius of the aperture at the center. Uh, so uh, basically they are uh, in um, um, uh, reverse um, um, uh, proportional um, the relationship between each other. So um, when the D gets uh, bigger, uh, then R gets uh, smaller uh, and vice versa. So the idea is that uh, if you have a uh, the component, uh, so if you stretch it, uh, and then uh, the, the aperture size will uh, shrink, and then uh, if you compress it, uh, the aperture size will increase. It was that simple. So the, the first idea was to um, um, put them uh, in a hexagon grid, uh, and then um, and then uh, starting from there, uh, we just uh, try to um, 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 the, uh, apply these to um, sort of like a wall system. So the idea that we had was like, you know, um, uh, it basically uh, respond uh, to the eye level uh, of the user. Uh, so if you get the, if you look at the section uh, closely. Uh, the, the the shape of the section uh, of the wall basically responds up to the uh, the elevation of your eye, right? So um, this is a uh, for sure this is not a uh, dynamic system. So uh, I would say this is a pseudo um, responsive system. Uh, but um, here in this diagram, as you can see, you know uh, the the aperture size uh, size is getting bigger uh, uh, when um, uh, your eyes are uh, on the wall. So this is the uh, section. Um, so uh, this is the, the building process of the uh, in uh, GC. Uh, so at that time, um, you know, this, this was the uh, only tool uh, available uh, for this kind of things, uh, except for uh, the explicit history, uh, which was uh, previously, uh, which was uh, the pre previous version of Grasshopper. Uh, so we uh, created uh, two surfaces. And then, um, you know, uh, imported uh, the point cloud uh, from Rhino model. And then this will generate a hexagon uh, grid like this. And then the, uh, the, uh, the module itself has two uh, circles, uh, one at the top and one at the bottom. And then uh, there's an intermediate uh, circle at the center. And then uh, this is uh, the, uh, the definition of this uh, component, um, uh, which is very dry, uh, unlike uh, that of Grasshopper. And then this is just you know overall process. Um, and then uh, back then, um, I wasn't really good at um, you know fabricating uh, or uh, scripting. So um, I just you know um, build the model in Rhino and then uh, unroll them uh, one by one uh, to uh, ledge code. Um, this is the other uh, physical model. All right. So this, the second project, uh, if you have time, <laughs> uh, is a, uh, the proposal uh, that I did uh, for, uh, for a design competition. Um, unfortunately, uh, we didn't make it uh, to the final, uh, but this is a uh, really interesting project, uh, at least to me. Uh, so the, here, the idea was to um, you know, uh, observe uh, physical behavior of a certain material. Uh, and then uh, you try to um, uh, give um, uh, some, you know, uh, changes 
uh, alterations uh, or uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, ch to basically change uh, its physical properties. And then uh, after you research uh, how it behave uh, under certain condition, and then you translate that into a, a digital model. And then uh, if you uh, make a system uh, that's basically um, uh, aggregation of that small uh, digital module, uh, then what's gonna happen uh, if you make uh, small changes in one of your modules? So here, uh, what I was trying to say was uh, sort of like uh, uh, in a part to your core relationship. So uh, the material that we use uh, was Myla, uh, which is a compound material. Uh, it is really homogeneous, and then uh, you can easily predict its behavior. So uh, here, the, the small patch of the Myla, uh, we started to uh, stretch it uh, on um, uh, both sides. But uh, because this doesn't have any uh, cuts or whatsoever, uh, it doesn't change its form uh, for sure. And then uh, once you have a cut at the center, uh, which is uh, parallel uh, to the direction of the force, uh, it doesn't change even though uh, the size of value, the size of the cut varies, right? But uh, if you, uh, you know, pull it uh, to the perpendicular uh, to the cut, uh, then it will change its form, uh, depends on uh, the size of the cut. So uh, we basically translate that into a uh, digital model uh, using Grasshopper. Uh, so um, here are two uh, primary variables, uh, parameters, and the secondary one uh, uh, in uh, purple. So the first one is uh, the load or force uh, that you know, stretches this module uh, up and down, right? And then uh, the other one, uh, the other parameter here is the size of the cut. So uh, depends on the size of the cut, uh, the deformation will, the, the, the amount of deformation will change drastically. Uh, so uh, what, this, uh, what this tells you is that, you know, uh, if you have a series of uh, modules uh, attached uh, to each other. So um, for some reason, um, you know, if your module uh, gets stretched, uh, then it will uh, shrink in width. And then there will obviously go another module uh, right next to it uh, as a, as a um, whole system. So uh, to simulate this in Grasshopper, uh, what we had to do was uh, to simulate the uh, elastic behavior of this material. So uh, it is a very well-known definition uh, that uh, to simulate uh, elastic behavior of a certain material, uh, then you have then you need two things. One is uh, all this dotted line uh, in red. Uh, they should uh, be always the same length on the mirror wall. And then uh, the other one is when you uh, you know remove your force uh, from the uh, system, uh, it should uh, go back to uh, the original status, uh, status uh, which is flat. So uh, which means. Uh, the every single uh, triangles in this module uh, will uh, always want to be uh, on the same plane. So there was two uh, constraints uh, that this module had. And then uh, after we array uh, those modules uh, in uh, like a six by six grid or something, and then we started a uh, map of different patterns of uh, point world and then uh, the coin size. So the, the red one, um, I think is uh, the, the size of the cut uh, expressed uh, as a series of a circle. And then uh, the, the, uh, the, the green circles, uh, the uh, right, uh, bottom right side uh, is the amount of point world uh, to each node of the, of the system. Uh, this is the uh, oval um, uh, grasshopper definition. So um, as a simulation, uh, we did this. Uh, so let's say that you hang your system on the wall. And uh, because of the self weight, uh, the, it starts to uh, deform.
And uh, if you add a uh, supplementary uh, weight uh, as a point load uh, to uh, some of those nodes, then it will deform once again. So we basically tested out lots of different combination of uh, those uh, patterns uh, of um, the current size and uh, the point load locations, etc. Uh, this is the, uh, the screen captures of the uh, sequence. Okay, so um, uh, this is uh, another project. Um, so how many times do you have um, before? <laughs> Sorry, you, you muted yourself. Uh, sorry, yeah. I mean, we have more time. I think it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I can keep doing this um, uh, on and on. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this was uh, another competition proposal that did, uh, and that unfortunately uh, I didn't make it uh, to the final as well. Uh, so lots of uh, failed projects here. Uh, but um, this is a uh, sort of like uh, 3D uh, DLA system. Uh, so um, you guys probably know what DLA system is. So uh, it is sort of like um, a, a process, natural process. Uh, when you have a, uh, the seed uh, in, your, uh, in the fluid, and then um, uh, around that fluid, you have lots of you know, particles moving around. Uh, which is a Brownian motion. So uh, when those particles are uh, very close to the seed, uh, then it stops moving and then create a sort of like an aggregation. So as time goes by, uh, the, uh, the seed uh, expand uh, uh, with a certain pattern. Um, you know, you can, uh, you can see those kind of patterns in the, 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 the particle of the snow, uh, uh, snow. Um, if you look at it uh, very closely with a magnifier or something, uh, then you can uh, find uh, something similar pattern like this. So um, the idea here was to um, expand uh, this uh, two-dimensional system into 3D and then uh, create uh, some uh, funky shaped uh, pavilion or something like that uh, using the system. So uh, the site is sort of like um, um, unaccomplished uh, building, uh, which has uh, lots of different types of openings. Um, the ceiling was not finished, uh, the windows was not finished yet. Uh, so lots of uh, old spaces in there. So uh, basically, uh, so let's say that uh, you have uh, three different um, you know, uh, faces uh, that is open to air, and then you have initial seat uh, at the center of the screen, and then um, what if we assume that uh, there will be a lots of particles coming in, uh, top, moving toward uh, the center point, uh, which is the seed. So um, here, the seeds are uh, falling down, uh, moving slowly toward uh, the seed at the center. And uh, it basically creates um, um, a funky shape. Uh, as time goes by. So uh, this was the, uh, the final render uh, for this proposal. Uh, I was thinking about uh, building this uh, if I won the competition uh, using 3D printers uh, with multiple colors. Um, but, um, okay, so anyways, uh, so um, I think I have uh, more projects, uh, but um, I'm not sure if I should continue, uh, but uh, let's say um, this is going to be the last one um, uh, for this session, uh, if that's okay with you. Yes, yes, it's totally fine. I mean, if it's fine for you, yeah. <laughs> We'd love to see your projects. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>
Um, this was another fabrication for us that I took at Cornell uh, back in 2000, I think it was 2008 or 2009. Uh, so uh, this was done in Maya by using uh, I know Hanjin is really, really good at it. Uh, but um, uh, the idea here was to uh, create a survey system uh, that has a really good balance between uh, their randomness and then uh, you know, uh, uh, organized uh, in a grid system. So uh, I want to say that uh, we put um, a uh, randomized pattern uh, uh, on top of a, uh, a very rigid grid system. Um, so uh, the way how we uh, start this product was uh, basically uh, uh, the uh, created uh, four uh, curved profiles uh, to create a patch. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, there were uh, basically two parameters for this. So uh, one is at the height of this uh, curve uh, at the peak point at the center. And then the other one is at the rotation angle uh, along uh, either X or Y axis. Uh, so uh, let's say that you have uh, created uh, four edges in this fashion, uh, and then you can create a uh, knob surface out of that, right? And then um, uh, to expand it um, uh, in XY plane, uh, so I started the weight of the one uh, here, uh, one here, uh, and then um, uh, to expand it in X direction. Um, you know, obviously, you need to share one edge uh, with uh, the previous model. So um, here in this in this picture, uh, your uh, first module will share uh, the edge uh, E002 uh, with E008 uh, of the next module. And the same thing happens uh, as you expand along the x-axis. And then uh, when you expand it to y-axis, um, you know, basically the same thing happens. Uh, so they are sharing this edge and they're sharing these edges as well. And then um, the, the other uh, part of the, uh, the system, uh, they will basically share at least two edges uh, with previously uh, created models. So this was uh, how uh, the system uh, grew uh, from the initial patch. And then, um, you know, the rest of the uh, edges, uh, for example, here, uh, this one, that one, that one, um, you know, you can create them uh, from uh, the random functions. So um, uh, this is the other uh, mail script uh, that I used. And uh, this is the other uh, axiometric um, of the system. And then um, I actually used a uh, CNC machine uh, to carve out this uh, out of blue form, which took um, a lot, lots of time. So um, I think you know this is um, uh, pretty much uh, uh, pretty much it. Um, so um, just let me know uh, if you want to see more. <laughs> <laughs> Or, um, you know, uh, you can just ask a bunch of random questions uh, if you have any. Um, I would be really happy to answer. Um, thank you very much for the, uh, yeah, I mean, great inspiring lectures, Uji. I mean, I really didn't expect, like, like we, I could see, like, this a lot of project of yours, and it was such a pleasure. So, I mean, yeah, the students, if there is any random questions, like he said, yeah. Don't be shy and then you can ask whatever it is, it's fine. Sorry, I just wanted to ask for your previous, uh, the, the Maya project that you just showed. How did you, uh, what material did you 3D, uh, what was it 3D print? I forgot what, how, how you made the actual model. Yeah, that was actually blue foam. Um, uh, that you used, uh, that you typically use to insulate your building. And then we use a CNC machine, uh, which was uh, huge enough uh, to uh, carve out um, up to like uh, two meters by uh, five meters or something like that. Oh, okay. And then it took like, um, um, I think it was uh, like uh, three hours in total. 
And then uh, at the end of um, the fabrication process, um, I accidentally bought the machine, bought the machine. So uh, there were a lot of complaints about me in the class. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hi. So, so amazing work. So I think, I think you have mentioned it in the presentation, but I'm not sure. You said that you, you didn't do residential for the first part. Did you say what, that? What that? Sorry, I didn't catch you. Oh, okay. You, I think I, I think you said in the first part that you didn't do residential buildings. Uh -huh. What do you normally do in the world? Because what there are. What you meant is, uh, I did uh, work on a couple of residential projects in New York uh, for sure. Uh, but what I meant specifically uh, in that context was uh, to design an apartment complex in Korea. So um, there's a huge difference between, uh, you know, a single building, uh, the smaller residential tower in the city context versus uh, the apartment complex, which is really huge. And then uh, that typically sits um, uh, on both uh, the city center or suburb uh, anywhere. So um, does that um, answer your question? I, yes, so, so uh -huh. do you do the, so do you do, so you, do you only do the optimization planning or do you also do the say drawing for the construction and cover the whole project until finish? What part do you come to? Um, you know, uh, I wish I could do everything by myself <laughs> if I can, but um, you know, the, uh, uh, the apartment complex is a huge thing, right? So. Um, um, the, my role here in this context is uh, very limited uh, in uh, the earlier phase of design, uh, mostly uh, focusing on uh, laying out buildings uh, in an efficient way. Uh, so every single unit gets sunlight uh, enough, and then uh, they can um, you know, have um, uh, privacy uh, from each other. Uh, that, that's, that's my role here in this context. And then, uh, after I, um, you know, produced a uh, series of uh, alternative layout uh, for the apartment complex, uh, then the architect will take it, and then uh, they will design uh, from there. Like, oh, you know, the facade. Oh, so, so the client comes to you first and let you organize the whole thing, or how does that work? Yeah, that's that's another uh, that's that's one way to uh, work on that project. Or um, the other way uh, around is, um, let's say that uh, you have, you are a developer, and then uh, you hire an architect, and then uh, they uh, give you a preliminary layout uh, for your building complex. And then if you are not happy with that, and then uh, he comes back to me uh, to check if this is right or not, and then uh, if there is any room to um, uh, enhance uh, the layout further. And then, um, you know, there's, there's going to be lots of feedback between uh, myself and the client and the, uh, the client's architect. So uh, there are a bunch of different ways to uh, uh, communicate uh, between those parties. Okay. Oh, okay, thank you. I think I can add up a bit of, about the apartment complex in Korea, because mm -hmm. usually, like like Uje said, it's a, such a, uh, a huge, huge project. And because of that, so, Usually the clients, uh, which is like usually is develop, uh, developer, but uh, like they divided into a lot of work into separate part. Like and so because of that, so a lot of a lot of people involved with the one just apartment complex, like Uje, so like Uje, so they can lay out the uh, the, the basic basic layout of the uh, the complex, and then there is also landscape designer to only design the uh, landscape and choose the choose the like trees and those kind of things and then there is an architect who going to actually uh, design the apartment building itself and then there is also exterior designer which is who is like design the yeah, like some details of the buildings and like they also design the yeah, some like the gate gate of the apartment complex as well and then they also can design like some 
like so I mean, like I said, the exterior itself. And then there is also interior designer, of course, like yeah, design is just interiors and and then the uh, also the, uh, there is some of the uh, structural designer. I mean, this is usual just work of the, uh, the architectural process. But however, yeah, something like this. I mean, this is very usual, like the, uh, the uh, distribution of the work uh, in Korean apartment complex. Yeah. So that's why the Uje was only taking part of the, uh, the optimization of the layout of the buildings. And then the other part, like, like they divide, they divided all the work like into the, it depends on their what they are working on. Thank, thank you. I, I went to Gangnam, South Korea, about two years ago, and okay. I think <laughs> just next, just next to Gangnam, there is like a very huge apartment complex right, where there are really a lot of tall, tall buildings uh -huh. that's grouped in that one area. And I am from Bangkok, and there are I don't think I know any place. I don't know the city planning of Bangkok doesn't that so it is very new to me, right? So I had to get lost into the complex and I like and I was quite amazed that oh this is like a it is like a what is it called? Uh it is like a house where but instead of a house it becomes an apartment building. So I really I, I think it's quite amazing there that they have a very good city planning in compared to Bangkok in that right. aspect yet. Yeah, like that. Yeah, it's a, 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 a bit a crazy city, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, there are lots of apartments complex in, in Seoul, especially the capital of Korea. Yeah. And then uh, the, the the strange thing is that uh, the, the Seoul, um, even if it is uh, uh, huge, uh, it is still expanding. <laughs> I noticed there are a lot of metal sculpture in Seoul, uh -huh. in Seoul, yes, why? Why is that a lot of cir circle metallic looking sculpture around Seoul? Do you, are you aware of that? Uh, yes, uh, because of uh, the wall, uh, the building called, um, uh, actually a zoning regulation or something, uh, that uh, basically force you to have any kind of sculpture uh, whenever you build a new building. So uh, that's probably why. Oh, oh, oh okay, I think. So they basically uh, spare a, a separate project uh, for that uh, sculptures, um, which is like um, um, a very strange um, thing. It's happening around here in the city. Um, any other uh, computational uh, digital design related questions? <laughs> Anyone? I mean, you can type, I mean, if you're shy to speak, like you can type in the chat, then I can speak around. Yeah, I mean, because I think it's because of your lecture was pretty much clear, I guess. Yeah, because I mean, it was especially, yeah, I mean, especially the uh, all the other project, like, yeah, I mean, it was quite clear to follow. But ah, I also was actually the uh, have a one like very basic question as well related to the the material things because when you show us the uh, the DLA project, uh, the yeah DLA project. You, you told us that the, uh, if, if you won the competition, it's going to be built by the 3D uh, printed material, right? Yeah. yeah. And then I also was wondering, like, uh, like in, a, in a structural way, I mean, like, I mean, it was like more like the design focus, but it seems like the tree shape. So which means like the, the, the bottom part is going to be get a lot of strength from the structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, was it also like uh, proved as a structural way as well? Well, um, we didn't get to that point uh, for sure because uh, we uh, were not able to make it the second round. Uh, but um, my idea was that, uh, you know, instead of uh, supporting the entire structure at the uh, center point uh, at the bottom, uh, if we hang it uh, from the um, from the building, uh, then uh. 
the fourth injury reduced uh, the stress are coming all the way down to the base. And um, uh -huh. you, you actually pointed out a really good point of using 3D printer uh, in a structural sense. So um, I was kind of aware of that uh, this is going to be issue uh, when you actually build it by uh, using 3D printers. Um, how do we deal with uh, the structural force uh, that's coming along uh, the, the members of each segment? So uh, that uh, hasn't been really sold out uh, clearly uh, because it was just the uh, you know, uh, design process. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you. And yeah, yeah, any others, like any random questions are fine. And no one? Yeah, I mean, you can you can ask me questions like, you know, how old are you or where do you live? <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite movie? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my favorite movie uh, was uh, Cinema Paradise. Um, if you remember that old movie, <laughs> yeah. and then I mean, it, the reason why I'm encouraging the uh, uh, ask you any questions, especially because, especially like I said before, the the Uge's, uh, first project, optimizing optimization of the apartment complex, is I think it's really related to what Taeyun is doing right now, isn't it? I mean. Like, I mean, to be honest, like I told you, I didn't focus that much about the Taeyun's, uh, Taeyun's session, but I know that the, it was, it is also about the optimizing, optimization about the, the some small cluster of the buildings, isn't it? So I think you guys know better than me about that then, because you are, I believe that you are focusing the uh, Taeyun's lecture. So, I think if there is a really question, uh, if there is any question, anything related to Taeyun's session and Uje's lecture, it will be really interesting and grateful. <laughs> right, uh, I think it's time to um, yeah. uh, uh, do the, uh, the third session. Yeah, and I, yeah, I think, yeah, so it's, hmm. yeah, I, was, I, was, I was saying that uh, it's hmm? time to uh, start this third presentation. <laughs> you didn't get that, uh, so. just, I was talking. <laughs> there is a one question in the chat, uh, maybe a question. What about the collaboration with office and site in terms of construction and planning? Uh, okay, well, what about the collaboration with the office and site? Uh, what do you exactly mean by um, the collaboration with office and site? Uh, does it make sense? Communication between planners and construction site. Can you a bit more specific about yeah. your Planner question? Contractors, right? So, um, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a really uh, general question. Um, about the uh, the collaboration between uh, design architect, architect and uh, contractors as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not always very smooth uh, uh, as you imagine, and so uh, there's, there's there's a lot of you know lawsuits um, between those parties, um, and then um, you know uh, fingering one another. Uh, blaming their faults, as <laughs> that's, uh, that's the reality um, of uh, the, uh, the way how we communicate with each other. But uh, in most cases, you know, um, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's such a broad question, so I can't really answer your question. <laughs> so can you uh, just narrow down your question um, so I can answer better? In terms of automation, uh, augmented reality. Um, yeah, that's still broad. <laughs> so, um, in terms of uh, AR, uh, I think you know uh, people start to using AR technology uh, in many different aspects, like um, uh, in the construction side, 
uh, basically uh, try to identify uh, the deviation be between uh, what's, what's been built and uh, what's been designed. Uh, or basically comparing um, what's been designed and uh, as it's built. Uh, so you can uh, install uh, your exterior panels or something like that. Uh, or uh, you can use AR uh, in maintenance. Um, for example, uh, you know, if you have a very complicated uh, belting system uh, that wraps around your building uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the corner that you can really reach, um, then you use, uh, you know, uh, drone uh, with some cameras, and then uh, they will, um, you know, um, um, basically um, show you um, uh, what's, what is happening uh, in this specific corner of the building. That's true. Or uh, if you're talking about uh, communicating between uh, the client and the uh, designer, um, while I was working at Grimshaw Architects in New York, uh, we used uh, VR a lot uh, to uh, visually communicate uh, with the client uh, as to uh, how this building will look like uh, when it's completed, uh, rather than uh, showing a couple of render shots. Uh, if we um, give uh, the client uh, the goggles, and then uh, he can easily look around in the building that hasn't been built. Uh, so that's, that's another way of using um, um, uh, VR uh, in communication. Um, in terms of automation, um, not sure what exactly uh, you were asking. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If there is any more questions, is there any? I mean, the last chance. And if there is any more questions, oh. Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's a long one. Oh, no, sorry. Oh, mm. I, uh, okay. It wasn't really. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if there is any questions later, I think you also can email to Uze, right? Like, yes. I think you can, yeah, you can, you can contact him easily from his, uh, from his website, S-A-P-N-D-A. -A. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or uh, if you, if you find it difficult to send to him, I mean, you can ask to, I mean, send to me to email, then I can afford to Uze as well. So, yeah. I think we can wrap up our lecture from here. Yeah, I mean, thank you very much for Uje because it was really inspiring lectures. And I mean, even for me, like I really enjoyed the lectures and it was very interesting. So yeah, I, think, I think it can be really helpful for the students in academic way and the, the practical way. So yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you very much, yeah. And by and the other all the other students, yeah, I think uh, like Taeyun said, uh, you can come back at like I think he said like eight thirty for Beijing time, right? So yeah, you can come back that at that time, and yeah, you can yeah, like just have us some break then, yeah. Then bye. I'm going to turn off. <laughs>